Goed, welkom uh, bij mijn uh, with my talk. Ja, yeah, thank you. <laughs> I already got a few pointers that I had to start in English. Uh, welcome to my presentation about dyslexia and programmers. Uh, creativity does not kill a cat. But first of all, I just want to introduce myself. Uh, I'm Peter van der Meer. I'm a father and boyfriend of two dyslectics, which is sometimes very funny at home because of words that we make up. I'm a data engineer at DataWork, which is a small company in the Netherlands, and we do data engineering and science. One of my advantages within my work is that I am a dyslectic. Thinking inside the box is a hard thing to do for me. And why do I take this presentation? Because I think there are a lot of misconceptions about dyslexia. Well, I want to start up with a question about who is dyslectic in this room. It's very hard for me to see. The number is quite low. Because it should be about 2 out of 10. Which is what I've seen in the room a little bit less. But that's probably because 6 out of 10 that are dyslectic are trying to hide it. Because there's some kind of shame on it. I give you an example of how a lot of dyslectics might encounter or perceive text. I'm just going to give you a few seconds to try and read this text. And if somebody says, yes, I can read it in one time, please raise your hand. Nobody does that, which was except uh, the expectation. This is actually what it says. This was a font that was created by uh, a, a designer who is dyslectic and always had troubles with, yeah, why is it so hard for you to read? It's just letters. But he created this font to give people that are not dyslectic sort of a feeling how hard it can be for a dyslectic to read some text. It's not that all dyslectics see their text like this, but it's something for others to get a feeling how it can be to read being a dyslectic. Up on the screen now is the Oxford uh, Dictionary description about dyslexia. And what it says, it's a general term for a disorder about reading, interpreting letters and words, but it does not affect general intelligence. The last line, nobody reads. Because in general, when you say to somebody, yeah, I'm dyslectic, oh, you're stupid, you're slow. It's a general perception. Okay, but if it's a disorder, what's wrong? Why are people talking about it? Because if you look at the numbers, and you go to the successful entrepreneurs, 40% of them are dyslectic. European average, just 20%. That's so double. If you go to the quote 500 companies and go to the higher management, just 1% is dyslectic. Something goes wrong there. You see a lot of dyslectic people in engineering, science, arts, the little bit more creative uh, lines of jobs. Just a few big names that you might not know were dyslectic. Uh, Einstein, a lot of people do not know that. You know why Einstein had a secretary? To write his documents. Steve Jobs was a dyslectic as well. Richard Branson, he quit school when he was 12 or 13 because he couldn't learn anything at school. Pe teachers were telling him, you're stupid. He's now one of the richer men in the world. Steven Spielberg and a lot of other people are, that are successful are dyslectic. If you look at the pictures in the backgrounds from my presentations, all of them are dyslectic. So even Tom Cruise is the dyslectic. A better one I should have put in here is, uh, who knows happy days? The font, yeah. You know why? He couldn't read the script. Okay, but they say it's a disorder. Okay, true. 
there are differences in how a dyslectic mind processes the phonological sounds of words and letters. We also have a difference in how we learn stuff from procedural, uh, so our procedural learning and procedural memory, that's, that's how we write, quick and very precise, and it takes, it's different for a dyslectic. And there's a big difference in the right and left hemisphere of the brain. When you learn something, something new, you do that in the right side of your brain. You're taking all your experiences and try to connect that to get that new skill to a certain level. A non-dyslectic brain will then move it to the left side of the brain where you can automate it and make it precise and quick. Dyslectics, yeah, sort of. But are these disorders? I wouldn't say so. They're just differences. The dyslectic mind processes information differently. But dyslectics are quite good at a few points that are in a lot of jobs are very useful. One of the things that dyslectics are strong in is material reasoning. If you ask a dyslectic who has this skill and you give him an empty room and make him fantasize about putting furniture in that room, he can do that within his head. A lot of great architects, they can do that. They just look at the empty room, fantasize about what should be in there, and it works. They just have to draw it later on. And if they talk about it with the customer, they just rearrange the furniture in their mind and say, oh yeah, you could put it there, but that won't match with something else. That's what the dyslectic can do, just in his head. Interconnected reasoning. Um, I always use the example, when a dyslectic mind goes into the field and see lettuce juice laying on the floor, on, on the cross, he looks up into the air. You might say, why? Because lettuce juice attracts rabbits. True, but rabbits attract birds. That's the connection they can make. They connect all the dots. So the lettuce juice is not for the rabbits, it's for the birds. Because they can have lunch then as well. That's the interconnected reasoning, connecting all the dots. And then we have narrative reasoning. That's using your memory, fragments of your memory, and reorder them. Dyslexics have, in general, very clear memory within, with details. And then we have something called dynamic reasoning. That's one that's most hard to explain. That's the one where they can talk and reason about something that has happened in the past and how it will progress into the future. So th those are a few skills that dyslectics in general excel in. It's not all of them, could be one, could be two, could be all of them to various degrees, but these are their skills. So actually, dyslectics look at the world in a different way. They don't use the binoculars just to see just far away. Sometimes they do, but sometimes they turn around and look at the small details just because it's a different viewpoint, and that's what they use to do their things. But the talk started about dyslectic programmers. Okay, but looking at, back at the things I, I told you, wh why is it the strength? The interconnected reasoning is what I said, uh, to connect the dots of various things, if you're doing a program and you, you've got an issue, it might be related to something that's totally out, uh, outside the area where you're looking. And because his, mind's, his mind works like, okay, yeah, we've got that, we've got that, we've got, oh yeah, but because this happens, it might be that somewhere down the line or where the problem comes from, that, that he's very good at that one. The narrative reasoning, eh? using your own personal experiences and being able to reorder them at will. That's a good thing. And the, dyna the dynamic reasoning. 
because this happens now, it will, this and that will probably happen in the future. Extending the growth of a system, for example, or making a certain design decision that he has done in the past and knows what comes out of it. My personal strengths, I'm quite good at interconnected reasoning. I see all the dots that are on the board and I can connect them. I do narrative reasoning, uh, so using my fragments from past histories. I communicate by means of drawings because my mind has all had the entire part already. I, I see that in front of me and I have a discussion with a colleague about a problem or something else. First thing I do, I go to a drawing board because otherwise I will lose him somewhere within two minutes. That's that one. But don't go to me for the nitty gritty details. Don't do that with any dyslectic because going into the abstract world, the average dyslectic will stop because he just loses it. Something practical. Because we have issues with reading and writing, and we make a lot of typos, and a programming language is just a bunch of letters, we make typos in there as well. What we call an IDE and a compiler, the best spell checker you can find. Word cannot outrun that, this one. Good thing, uh, another good thing is that the average program is f fairly small. It's quite easy to understand, we can read it, we can take our time to read it and it won't take a lot of time. And we do have a lot of repetitions. Because repetition, even for a dyslectic, it will help. If for an average person, it will take 10 iterations to automate something, a dyslectic might use 50 or 60 times to do that. So in code, we re repeat a lot, so it works. And there are a lot of tools available. Go to WhatsApp, spell, spelling check. So there's no reason to. I want to change the definition in the dictionary like this, because it's not a disorder. I would almost say it's an advantage, because we are a lot more creative than the average Joe. And I like the last one, it's an umbrella slang word for something they don't understand. I want to finish up by a closing statement and that in which I say, okay, this dyslexia in, as a programmer within your team can be a plus because he looks at the stuff that you have differently. But be aware if you got a team that, with all kinds of abstract thinkers, don't even put a dyslectic in there because he will get lost because he doesn't understand them and they don't understand him. It has to be a mix and a balance. And I'm going to leave you with an end note. Everybody is a genius, but if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will feel its entire life stupid. And that's what's happening with a lot of dyslectics. The general feeling is you're a dyslectic, you're slow, and you might be stupid which is not the case. We just take longer to read and write stuff. That's my talk. Please rate me if you want to. Any questions or remarks? I don't see anything. Thank you.